After the Paris Peace Accords were signed on January 27, 1973, the U.S. Marine combat role in Vietnam was supposed to end. It's a, it's a peace agreement that doesn't in any sense bring peace. What it does provide is for U.S. military withdrawal. Uh, the North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese are both uh, ready, willing, and able to continue the war on their own terms uh, once the United States is out. And that's exactly what happens. MACV was decommissioned on January 29th and replaced by the smaller Defense Attaché Office located in Saigon. The last American combat soldier was heading home. It was only fitting that the last infantryman was a Marine. The largest contingent of Marines remaining in Vietnam consisted of the five officers and 140 enlisted men from Company E of the Marine Security Guard Battalion. They were stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Over the next 15 months, there would be little fighting in Vietnam by either side. Instead, the North Vietnamese spent this time preparing for their final assault on South Vietnam. By May 1974, the NVA had resupplied and refitted its regular army divisions. They were now ready to resume their assault into South Vietnam. Meanwhile, the United States had cut their military aid to South Vietnam from $2.2 billion to $700 million. So while the NVA was building up for a final campaign, the Republic of South Vietnam was forced to cut back. Uh, Nixon uh, sort of palliates too by, uh, by making some secret promises to him uh, that if there is a North Vietnamese uh, attack, he will respond with air power, uh, agreements that are not approved by anybody else. Uh, he also promises uh, heavy, uh, an influx, heavy influx of equipment, machinery, and this sort of thing. This assistance would never come. Relying on T-54 and Type 59 tanks, NVA troops quickly swept through South Vietnam. By December 1974, they had taken all Arvin outposts in the Quang Duc province attacked the Binh Dinh province's Phu Cat Air Base and launched an attack on the Mekong River Delta. The NVA also succeeded in moving the entire 968th Division into South Vietnam's Central Highlands. This marked the first time that a complete division had entered South Vietnam at one time. Thinking that the Central Highlands could not be defended, President Nguyen Van Tu ordered it abandoned on March 14th. Two hoped that sacrificing the Central Highlands would allow his soldiers to fight at a more defendable position of their choosing. However, the NVA Chief of Staff, General Van Chin Dung, had other plans. Dung ordered all available forces to attack the fleeing Arvin troops. The long column of escaping soldiers and civilians was ripped apart by NVA artillery. Of the 20,000 soldiers who left the Central Highlands on March 16th, only 5,000 made it to safety. As time was running out for the Republic of South Vietnam, President Tu began to panic. On March 30th, the NVA captured Da Nang without firing a single shot. On April 21st, President Tu resigned and fled to Taiwan. Six days later, the nation assembly elected General Duong Van Minh to replace him as the last president of South Vietnam. As Minh took the oath of office on April 28th, a vastly superior North Vietnamese army reached Saigon. In its final days as a country, South Vietnam asked the U.S. Marines for one last favor. The United States had been preparing evacuation strategies since the NVA offensive began in December 1974. Even though the Paris Peace Accords technically ended U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, 
the U.S. continued to prepare soldiers for deployment on Okinawa. However, many Marines noticed a significant change in their training. When I was in 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines at Camp Pendleton, a tactical operation consisted of doing an amphibious operation, taking an objective, you know, practicing the deployment of your platoons and maneuver, fire, uh, maneuvering by fire and maneuver and everything else. But our tactical exercise at Okinawa before our deployment, because you go there as a deploying unit, you go in as a unit that is in pre-deployment training, is three phases, where they build up the battalion at that point in time. They build up the battalion, to get it to full strength. When that battalion is at full strength, they, they rehearse and practice their uh, tactics, and then they go through a tactical exercise. It's a test to see if you're ready to be deployed. The tactical exercise was an evacuation exercise. The Marines first tested their new training at Phnom Penh in Cambodia on April 12, 1975. The mission codenamed Eagle Pull called on Marines to evacuate American and Allied personnel from the city. This was in December of 1974. I'm like, oh, we've never done one of these before. You, usually we hit the beach up on the other side of the, the island in Okinawa, and, and uh, that's strange. This is a real strange exercise. And uh, actually they called it Eagle Pole. I'm like, Eagle Pole, okay. And it, didn't, it, it really didn't hit me at that time what it was. And the scenario basically was you're landing in a, uh, you're landing at an embassy and you are evacuating uh, military personnel and selected uh, civilians. So you had to process the cards. You know, these people supposedly would be processed for evacuation. First priority would be military personnel. Second priority might be personnel who worked for the embassy that would, if you left them there, would be certain to die and everything. And I'm like, okay, well, this is a pretty interesting thing. So I thought, but I didn't think about it. I mean, it really didn't even phase me with respect to what that was all about. And at that point, we, thought, we knew we were going to do an evacuation and we knew it was going to be Vietnam. And the guy that was feeding me information about, you know, the Vietnamese are coming all the way down the, the peninsula and eventually they're going to hit Saigon and it's all hell's going to break loose. It's going to be their territory and we're not doing anything except that we are going to have to evacuate the embassy. When intelligence reports indicated that Saigon would fall in a matter of weeks, President Ford approved Operation Frequent Winds. 6,000 Marines and Navy corpsmen had been assembled outside of Saigon in the previous weeks. Using CH-53 helicopters, these soldiers would be responsible for evacuating all American personnel, South Vietnamese VIPs, and as many other people as they could manage. Evacuees would gather at predetermined locations and wait for the helicopters to arrive. With their forces in place for Operation Frequent Wind, the Marines waited for the order to go. So we all got our, our, uh, our, ourselves ready for an evacuation of the embassy. This time it was going to be all of BLT-24 that was going to go in. So basically uh, we, we got there sequence was basically this. You get up in the morning at 3 o'clock, feed the troops from about 4 o'clock to 5, give them their ammo, put them in sticks, wait for the helicopters. Because if we're going to leave, we're going to leave before 5 o'clock, element of surprise. They then, nothing happened by noon, secure the troops, collect the ammo, put the kids to bed, wake them up 3 o'clock next morning all over again. We did that for two weeks. This particular day, it was 1.30 in the afternoon. The kids were still asleep. Marines were still asleep or just hanging around, getting their stuff put away. And the captain came on board, and I mean, he was flat-winded. I mean, he was just like he had been running for God knows how much. He says, this is the captain speaking. This is the captain speaking. Now hear this, now hear this. All hands, man your battle station. Uh, land a landing force. Uh, you know, I think we're late for the war. In the early hours of April 29th, 
the NVA launched a rocket barrage on the Tansanud Air Base. During the assault, Corporal Charles McMahon and Lieutenant Corporal Darwin Judge were killed. They would be the last American casualties of the Vietnam War. U.S. Ambassador Graham Martin visited the airbase that morning and decided it was time to close the embassy. At 10.51 a.m., Operation Frequent Wind was put into full effect. Major Alan Broussard took part in the evacuations of Saigon. I was commander of the battalion reserve. Battalion reserve is usually an extra company that's left behind uh, that you interject into a fight if something happens in a specific area. After landing, Major Broussard's orders were to enter the DAO annex, assist and control evacuees, and be prepared to reinforce any company as needed. Uh, that changed before I got in there. Uh, as soon as we got on the aircraft, uh, my, pit, my mission changed significantly. As a matter of fact, I, my mission at that point in time was to secure the Tonsonu uh, uh, passenger terminal and, and take my, my company and, and secure the passenger terminal uh, and get prepared for evacuation of civilians. Well, by the time we got over the, uh, the air base there at Tonsonut, uh, um, we were flying over it, and I'm looking for the air, I'm looking kind of from the air for the uh, passenger terminal. And I'm like, oh my God, I think, I think we passed it. And so I went up to the pilot, and I kind of tapped him on the shoulder, and I says, where are we going? He says, you're going to, uh, he says, your mission has changed. Lima Company has gotten misplaced, and you need to go to the DAO Annex and assume the, uh, assume the positions of Lima Company. I said, it's not a problem. Just tell me where Lima Company belongs. So we did. We landed in the DAO Annex, uh, went to the, company, the battalion commander, basically got to the CP, and uh, with my gunny, we found out where the positions were, and we went out and we secured the perimeter for that particular base. It was then that the Marines had an unexpected visitor. About 15 or 20 minutes later, um, one of my troops came up to me and said, sir, you gotta come over here, there's a problem. And I said, what's the problem? He said, sir, I, I don't know, but I think there's a Russian tank out there. And I said, what? He said, there's a Russian tank out there. So I go to his position and I look at him and I said, uh, where? And he pointed out there and I'm looking down the barrel of a freaking two, T-72, just sitting there. Uh, sitting there and I said, you know what, uh, we need to get down just a little bit and keep ourselves in cover and if something happens, uh, be prepared to, uh, uh, to do, do what we got to do. Uh, but this might be not a good thing. As it, as it turned out, I think the Vietnamese knew that we were evacuating and they weren't going to get in our way. Actually, if they, they, they would have gotten our way, I think they would have been obliterated with B-52s from uh, Utapau, Thailand. I mean, they, they were ready to, to just nail the place. But they watched us the whole day evacuate all these things. Aircraft coming in, aircraft going out, and every once in a while they'd throw a SAM missile at one of, the, uh, one of the helicopters going out just to scare us or just to get our attention. With the Russian tank looking over their shoulders, Broussard and his men spent the day helping evacuees at Tan Sanut get to their loading areas. And uh, it was a pretty interesting day. We essentially secured the, secured the position, and our job was to take people from uh, some of some of our job was to take some people from uh, positions on one side of the DAO annex to the other side because they had two two evacuation spots uh, when the helicopters came in. We had to ask the passengers to leave all their stuff there and basically get on the aircraft. Uh, and, and that was kind of harrowing. The first wave of CH-53s arrived at the annex at 3.06 p.m. Marines stationed at the complex formed perimeters around the helicopters and helped evacuees get on board. Once the CH-53s were filled to capacity, they took off and headed toward the sea. Another wave of helicopters appeared at the annex a few minutes later, and the process was repeated until everyone was evacuated. Over 395 American citizens and another 4,475 Vietnamese were saved that day. And so when we got to the aircraft, of course, I'm, 
11 o'clock, I'm kind of antsy because I'm watching, it's getting dark, and I'm watching Sam's being tossed around while all these aircrafts are coming, all, our, all these aircraft are coming through. And I'm like, okay, I've got 51 Marines in my, in my platoon, and I've got to get these guys out of here. And uh, so I called up headquarters, or I called up the CP, and he says, you're, you're next on the rotation. He says, uh, just stand by and we'll get you out of there shortly. And I said, aye, sir. Shortly after 11, a CH-53 was sent to pick up the reserve battalion. These powerful sea stallions were capable of carrying up to 55 men and were used almost exclusively in the evacuation of Saigon. Well, prop wash is blowing us and I'm standing there with 75 pounds of gear all over me and two guys pushing me so that I could stay standing. That's not a 53 that belongs to the Marine Corps. That's something a hell of a lot more powerful. So look at it, it was a 53. I didn't give a shit at that point in time. It looked like an Air Force plane. It was an Air Force plane. So uh, it got on and I'm counting my Marines. I was like, let's get on. There's 50 Marines on this damn aircraft so we can get in and we can get out of here. And I'm counting them as we're going through 50 and 51 and 52, 53. I got two more than I came with. So I, oh, yeah, I got no time. We got to get out of here. And about that time, my last two guys were trying to get on the aircraft, and they couldn't get in. And so I'm shouting a few expletives at them, get the hell on that air aircraft, and if I have to kick your ass all the way up there, that's exactly what I'm going to do. But that air aircraft's got to lift up because they don't want to sit very long here, especially if it's an Air Force guy. He wants to go home. And I said, uh, get on the aircraft. And the kid says, sir, I can't get on the aircraft. And all of a sudden, the aircraft starts lifting. I took, took the one kid by the, by the pants and the other kid by the pants, and I literally just took them and threw them over the top of the other two or five, two to five Marines over the top of them and just pushed them up there. And then I jumped on the helicopter, and of course the, the ramp is coming up and it pushed me back in. Then I'm really cursing like a sailor. I mean, I'm like, you dumbass, da 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 basically. We got 50 Marines on this aircraft when we came in, and we got 51 or two going out. What's going on? And somebody in the back tells me, sir, this, uh, this aircraft has a 106 recordless rifle on it, on a mule. I'm like, a mule and a recordless rifle? Now this combat load isn't kind of configuring. Meanwhile, Saigon was in a panic. Since the morning of April 29th, the NVA had been firing long-range artillery into Saigon. It seemed that everyone in the city was trying to escape by air. Even some of the Marines were in a hurry to get out of the city. First thing I'm trying to figure out, I've got two extra bodies. Who in the hell are these bodies? So I'm taking my role again. I'm saying, who's here that shouldn't be here? Nobody raised a hand. And I'm going down the numbers. I'm going, okay, who's, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And I finally get to these last two guys. And one of them was a corpsman. And one of them was uh, assigned to the Bravo command group, which was there. The executive officer was supposed to be. I looked at him and I said, young man, is it, how did you get on my ship? How did you, how did you get with my, my guys? He looks at me and he says, this was the first thing I saw going out. I'm getting on the damn aircraft. After reaching their ship and a night sleeping on the deck, they awoke to a strange sight. The sky looked like, it, it literally looked like the sky was filled with bees. That's the best description I can give you. And as they came a little closer, we realized that they were helicopters. And I'm like, what are they doing? And of course, all of a sudden, there was a big scramble. I mean, the, you know, the sounds, the sirens and everything were going off. Now I hear this, now I hear all my hands, man, your battle station. Uh, we have, it looks like uh, the Vietnamese army has deserted and they have taken aircraft and are just flying them in willy-nilly. So we all get out there and then they, they grab me and he says, look, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna fold these aircraft down as soon as they come in. Uh, what I need you to do with your Marines is to basically get a group, download them, take their weapons away from them, throw them in a pile over here, take their pigs and chickens and throw them overboard, and basically escort them down to the foxhole, which is the front of the ship, underneath. I said, so I got my, my guys broken down into doing that. The rest of you, he says, when we get these ships, we, we fold back the uh, helicopter pad, the helicopter blades. All I need you to do is push the aircraft. We're going to push them over. I'm like, what? So I'm like, oh man, this is gonna be exciting. Uh, and it did, and I mean, when they started coming in, they were looking 
for any place that they could find to land an aircraft. And literally what scared the hell out of us was is they didn't understand our language, most of them. So what we had was people hovering over an aircraft that was being unloaded and just sweating bullets that he wouldn't lower that aircraft down to get caught in the blade and everything go to hell in the handbasket. So eventually we, we unloaded for probably about, uh, oh, seven hours, just pushing them off. The incoming aircraft were filled beyond what the manufacturer had ever estimated. One Huey helicopter, a Huey, a little skid thing that the Army uses all the time. There were 34 people in it. 34 people, this whole six, seven maybe. They were little kids sitting on people's laps, on their shoulders, and on top of their shoulders was another child. And as I'm pulling them out, I'm counting them because I couldn't believe that there was that many people in this helicopter. I mean, I just didn't think that it would fly. So we pulled them all out. Take it, take it, throw, throw the pigs and the chickens off the aircraft, uh, you know, throw all the weapons over in this pile over here. By the time we finished, we had a pile of weapons that was probably uh, 25, 30 feet in diameter and probably 10 feet tall. Weapons, any kind of weapons you can think of. It was at this time that Broussard witnessed a most unusual carrier landing. Um, eventually, we got them all in. Then all of a sudden, some pilot comes in with a Piper Cub, some major in the uh, South Vietnamese Army. And he's determined to land on that, on that pad. I mean, we're still pushing stuff off. So the ship commander, uh, the captain of the ship, takes the ship and he's doing everything he can to tell the guy, ditch it, we'll go out and get you. You know, we'll have a helicopter standing by and we'll go pull you out. I got my family in the car, in the, uh, in the vehicle. So, and I'm landing on that ship. And they don't have any means to fly Piper Cub and land on, a, on an aircraft carrier. I mean, if you catch its wheels, it's liable to blow up and kill people. So this guy is trying to get in position to where he can fly in, and the captain of the ship is turning the ship around every way so that he could be opposite of where he was and, and not being in a position to where he could land. And that lasted probably an hour, hour and a half. And finally, he just ran out of gas, and he said, I'm coming in. And he came in, and, he, and we, they moved all of us downstairs, and we're watching it on a TV downstairs. We're watching the flight operations. This guy flies that aircraft in right there, and nobody was hurt. That was amazing. As the Marines helped unload South Vietnamese aircraft landing on their ships, the U.S. Embassy was still being evacuated. At 5 a.m. on April 30th, Graham Martin boarded a CH-46 helicopter and left the Embassy. At 7.50 a.m., a, a CH-46 came into sight of the Embassy. Two minutes later, the Marines were safely on board the helicopter and flying toward safety. The Marines' longest war was finally over.